Hello and welcome to Beacon Church online service. This is a shortened extract of our previous service which we are now holding at the Watergate Centre in Whitchurch. Uh, we will continue to provide uh, these online service uh, segments. But you're very welcome to come and join us uh, in Whitchurch at the Watergate Centre. Uh, you would need to let us know in advance to sign up because of the current Covid regulations but we do look forward to seeing you soon.
draws up to a junction in his car just as the lights are turning yellow. He does the right thing, stops, even though he could have beaten the red light by accelerating across the crossing. But the woman in the car behind him was furious and honks her horn at him and gesticulates wildly and screams in frustration because she misses her chance to get through the lights. As she was still in mid-rant, there was a tap on her window and she looks up in the face of a very serious looking police officer. She was ordered to exit the car and taken to the police station where she was searched, breathalyzed, photographed, fingerprinted and placed in a holding cell. After a couple of hours, the officer approaches the cell and opens the door. She was escorted to the booking desk where she sees the arresting officer waiting for her with her personal effects. He said, I was very sorry for the mistake. You see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn and shouting at the man in front of you. I noticed the what would Jesus do sticker on your bumper alongside the follow me to Sunday school in the rear window and the chrome plated fish symbol on your boot. So naturally, I assumed you had stolen the car. Right, the um, bit of uh, freedom in Christ we're up to now is handling emotions well, okay? Uh, if you didn't get that from the, uh, the story to start off with. Um, yeah, emotions, funny old things. Uh, my father's family, I'm going to be quite careful with this just in case my mother's listening to this. <laughs> but I shall say my memories of my, of my father's family, not so much my father, but my father's family, was that they never really talked about the fe their feelings particularly. Um, but emotions ran very high. Um, so they would laugh one minute and they'd be ready to kill each other within seconds it would go from one thing to the other. There was no real in-betweens. In fact, when we got married, um, my father actually didn't give a father of the bride speech when we got married because he was so worried about my uncle's heckling during the wedding service, um, which did go on a little tiny bit, uh, although it was my aunt uh, and she was very, very drunk. Um, Anyway, uh, the, uh, the reception actually finished with a rather large punch-up <laughs> by my uncles, um, which was broken up by a very dear family friend. Thankfully, we missed all that. We'd already gone. Um, but anyway, uh, acknowledging love or pride in us as children was hard for my dad. You know, he used to say, well, that was for wallies or for wimps, and it was a bit weak or it was a bit pathetic or it was a bit wet. Um, he, he had trouble with stuff like that. Um, of course, there are other ways to demonstrate love, and he was quite good at other ways. Um, if you've ever read, there's a book by a chap called Gary Chapman, not, no relation to Glynn, by the way, um, called The Five Love Languages. Uh, it's a, it's a worth a read if you don't understand somebody who you're quite close to. Um, anyway, emotions, they can be very good. Uh, they can be quite destructive. Um, emotional outbursts can lead towards you know, incontrollable anger or in inability to control your feelings at all. They can get very out of hand. However, the capacity for emotion was created in us by God. They're part of our humanity. They are not intrinsically wrong, no matter what you may have experienced in your life. How do we understand our emotional nature? How is it related to what we believe? Our emotions are good things, are they not? Can we control them? Some people are avoiders of strong emotion, as I said before, and some people are all in, and they believe they should be able to let them all out, all over the place, um, regardless of the damage they can sometimes cause. Freedom in Christ, the course we've been following, um, challenges us to believe what God says, regardless of how we feel. So what is the difference between how we feel, our feelings and our emotions? To deny our emotions can, can cripple us emotionally, lead us to have mental health issues. 
it says in the, um, in the course that the emotions are like a barometer to our souls. So if you don't know what a barometer is, a barometer is a device for estimating what the weather will be like. Will it be fair? Will it be sunny? Will it be calm? Will it be stormy? I suspect my husband would have liked it if I'd actually had one of these visible, particularly when we were bringing up small children, because you enter the house, your beloved, be it a male or a female at this point or whatever, has had not a perfect day. You haven't seen the children spread the breakfast all over the place. You haven't seen the difficult conversation that you had with somebody at the doorstep. They haven't seen that. And they arrive home to their beloved spouse thinking the dinner will be there and the house will be beautiful and they're met with something rather different. That's the barometer that they can't see. Would that they could. However, in our own lives, we do have, if we're Christians at least, something called the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit can help you within yourself as your own personal barometer. Anyway, thinking about our emotions, we'll get back to it. It can be hard to separate the good from the bad. How should we respond? How should we feel about things that God wants us to feel? I have to, again, thank my husband for this. Um, I've got four Gs. There you go, the perfect sermon. Four Gs. Number one, God is great. So we don't have to be in control. Tommy was seven. He wanted to walk to school on his own. His mother wanted to give him the feeling that he had some independence, but wanted to know that he was safe. So she asked a neighbor who had a younger child if she would follow him to school because the younger child was at the nursery next to the school. And so she'd follow him at a distance so that Tommy wouldn't notice. So each day, the neighbor and her little girl would go following behind Tommy on the way to school. She did every day for the first week. And Tommy was joined on the way to school by another friend. As they walked, the two children walked, chatted, kicked stones, twigs and such like. And Tommy's little friend noticed that the same lady seemed to be following them every day. Finally, she said to Tommy, have you noticed that lady following us to school all week? Do you know her? Tommy said, yeah, I know who she is. Little girl said, well, who is she then? He said, oh, that's just Shirley Goodnest. And her daughter, Marcy. Shirley Goodnest? Who's she? And why is she following us? Well, Tommy explained, every night my mum makes me say my prayers. And we say the 23rd Psalm to sit together because she worries about me. It says, Shirley Goodnest and Marcy will follow me all the days of my life. And so I'll say, I suppose I'll just have to get used to it. <laughs> Anxiety and worry. The fears of not being in control of our lives, all the world around us. Anxiety. Is it wrong? Well, Jesus felt anxious. It says in Luke 22, 44, he prayed with such anxiety that his sweat was like drops of blood. Emotions are, to some extent, to the soul, what physical pain is to the body. Jesus felt physical and emotional pain, but he still did the will of the Father. He knew that God was great above his own circumstances. Few of us will be called on to surrender our lives so the plan of God can be fulfilled, but people have and still are today. If we take control of our lives, we can dominate people, we can manipulate others, or we can live in fear of being out of control or worry or overwork. This is often a problem for parents who can end up unconsciously trying to manipulate their children's lives one way or another, even when they're adults sometimes. If God is in control of our lives or we allow him control of our lives, things may not go the way we want them to. But God promises that he will work things out 
for good. Sorry, that was James' watch falling over. I forgot mine this morning. I'm going to put that in my pocket. So 1 Peter, we said it this week, that was our reading this morning, 5, 7 to 8. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. My second favorite scripture for this one with anxiety is this, Galatians 2.20. This is literally my favorite piece of uh, um, quote in the Bible. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. What God says about us is true, regardless of how we feel. If God says he loves me, it's true, even if I don't feel loved or lovable. I no longer live. The life I live now is the life I sacrificed at the cross with Christ. So God is great. Number two, God is glorious. So we don't have to fear others. Every generation responds to a crisis differently. One time during a dinner out, my mother and my aunt got into a huge fight over the latter's spending. My mother, prone to dramatic displays, I just want to point out right now, this is a story, this is not my mother. Uh, my mother, prone to dramatic displays, protested by leaving the restaurant and lying down in the middle of the road. Everyone immediately rushed outside. My dad was trying to convince her to get up and get out of the road. I was redirecting cars. My two uncles were trying to calm down the gathering crowd behind us. And my aunt eventually apologized. And my mother agreed to get up. We suddenly realized that my younger brother, who was 20 at the time, was missing. Fifteen minutes later, we finally found him crouching behind a large bin. When asked why he was hiding, he said, I don't want to end up on YouTube. <laughs> the fear of man, the craving of approval of others in our jobs, our schools, and socially fearing their rejection, this is by far the disease of our age. Social media dominates our lives, many people's lives. They live to please others. They're controlled by peer pressure. They take multiple selfies so they get the perfect one to put on the internet. They're terrified of people finding out what they're really like. This was one of the temptations that Jesus tried on, Je the devil tried on Jesus in the wilderness. Matthew 4, 8 to 10. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. I will give you the highest ratings on Instagram. You can be a YouTube sensation, Jesus. You can be on every television program. People will worship you if you bow down to me. You can have it all, the popularity, the adoration, and none of the pain, but. If I could offer you a life without pain and suffering, would you have it? Would you take it? The ability to feel pain, actually, is protective. Any doctor will tell you this. It warns us of danger to ourselves. But suffering and grief can do that, too. They can refine us. They can make us stronger. They can make us more compassionate to the needs of others. Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid of those that kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. One of our daughters, I won't tell you which one, had a tendency towards angry. And we would tell her, that the more often she lost her temper, the more that she was decorating the room or the house of her internal life with furniture that was attractive to anger. So if you decorate too well, 
your room of your house with anger. Sooner or later, a spirit of anger will come along and like the furniture so much that it decides to move in. And then you've got problems evicting it. And that is something about how if we don't deal with things that we can deal with, things that we can have some control over, we can decorate part of our lives with a tendency that way. And when it says the devil's roaming around like a rolling out, seeking who may be, may, so, sorry, blah, 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 seeking whom he may destroy, he's looking for things that already are a bit of a mess, a little bit out of control. Have you decorated that room too well with worry or anxiety or fear? How's it looking, that room in your life? If what we believe doesn't reflect the truth, then what we feel will not actually reflect reality. Can we control how we feel to some extent our feelings? Yes. Um, teenage me, um, sorry to all your teenagers here, I had a tape of songs I would play to myself when I wanted to be miserable. You know, go in my room, I've decided to be miserable. I had my tape of songs, my miserable songs. If you concentrate on unhappy things, you get unhappy. It's the way it is. If I thought that everybody didn't love me, I could go away and convince myself by playing those songs. Um, if you watch a happy film, even if you're feeling a little bit miserable, you know, you can feel a bit happy. Um, it can work to some extent. Um, King David wrote Psalms. Some people write poetry. Um, you can go look at your old photographs, get your holiday snaps out. They can make you feel better for a bit. Um, you can write journals, you can count your blessings. They can all work on your feelings, which come and go, but those deep emotions inside you, those can be a little bit trickier to get a handle on. What about fear, for example? This is an interesting one. Let's say you're afraid of flying. That's a real and genuine emotion, fear. Man wasn't actually built to fly, so fair enough. Um, but what is your fear actually based on? I've got some facts for you here. This is quite fun. Are you afraid of a plane itself or actually potential death? So here's some statistics for you. If you lived to the age of 75, your chances of dying in an aeroplane accident, which includes accidents on the ground, however, are 1 in 54,433. Dying in a car, by the way, is 1 in 413. Okay, in 2010, yes, I know it was a while ago, but these were the closest figures I could get. In the UK, so let's narrow it nice and down, 22 people died in air and space accidents. So that's not just air, that's space as well. I didn't look up how many space accidents there were that year, but 22 people. Okay, 53 people died falling off a ladder. I'd like to point out 47 of those were men. I say nothing. Um, 655 people died falling down the stairs. And more people died of this than um, died in a plane or in space. 29 people died in the bathtub. There you go. Be afraid next time you're in the bath. It's more dangerous than getting on a plane. There you go. Now you know. So if what we believe doesn't actually reflect the truth, then what we feel will not reflect reality. So God's approval of us matters more than that of anyone else. If we have his approval already in Jesus who died for us to make us right with God, God is glorious and we need to find our security in him. Number three, God is good. Almost there. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of God's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He's made my skin and my flesh grow old. He's broken my bones. He's besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He's weighed me down with chains even when I cry out or call for help. 
He shuts out my prayer. He's barred my way with blocks of stone. He's made my paths crooked like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding. He's dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He's drawn his bow. He's made me the target of his arrows. He's pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I've become a laughing stock of all people. They mock me in song all day long. He's filled me with bitter herbs. He's given me gall to drink. He's broken my teeth with gravel. He's trampled me in the dust. I've been deprived of peace. I've forgotten what prosperity is. I say my splendor is gone and all that I'd hoped for from the Lord. And I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall, I well remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. There you go. That one's in the Bible for you. If you didn't know what it's like to be depressed, I think that's probably a good one. There you go. If you thought God was good, somebody in the Bible didn't think so. <laughs> that was from Jeremiah, by the way, written by Jeremiah. It's in Lamentations. If you really want to make yourself deeply miserable, uh, you can have a, t a tape of songs that make you that way, or you can read Lamentations. It's pretty grim. Um, it's hard to believe it's actually in the Bible. For all those people that think that you can't have a good moan at God, it's there in the book. You can. You know, if you're having a hard time, you can phone your mother. She doesn't mind if you've got one, having a good old moan. God doesn't mind either. It's perfectly scripturally okay. Um, you know, tell him how you feel. There it is. If this was your perception of what God was like, however, um, you would be pretty depressed. Um, David told God what he thought in the Psalms quite a lot. Um, thankfully, by verse 21, Jeremiah does uh, get himself a bit sorted out. Um, he changes his way of looking at his circumstances. The circumstances themselves for him haven't actually changed. All that changed was his thoughts and feelings towards those circumstances. So by 21, he says, yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. He changed his view of his own circumstances. So yes, we can have a good moan. We can get depressed. We can get, um, you know, things can get bad. But we can look at God's perspective. I'm going to read you um, a fairly long quote now from a, uh, the wife of um, Rick Warren who wrote the book Purpose Driven Life. Um, and, and this is actually the best bit of my sermon. And I didn't write it. So uh, I'd like you to listen to this. Happiness, so happiness being a feeling, is completely connected to what's happening to us on the external circumstances of our lives. Joy, however is unrelated to what's happening to us on the outside. If joy is only tied to our external circumstances, we are all lost. Very few of us ever experience jo joy. But when joy is turned around, as my definition of joy has been, I've found that it's the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right and the determined choice to praise him in all things. This has nothing to do with what circumstances are happening in my life. It has everything to do with what I believe about God, what I be believe he can do on the inside of me and my choice then in response to what's happening to me is to give praise back to him. That becomes something that's within my control. I can't always control what's happening to me on the outside, but I can most definitely control 
my response to what I do with it, what I believe about God, what I believe he's going to do about it. So then joy actually becomes something I can attain. Karen Warren talks about dealing with breast cancer, the setbacks she's had, and how she's managed to deal with them. I've had hard times, but so has everybody else. I mean, if I were able to sit down with every person hearing this and were able to just sit down over a cup of tea or coffee, we could share our lives and each of us could talk about the painful things, the sad things, the heartbreaking moments. I've had those as well. Some in my family, some happened in my past as a child, some were health concerns, some have been relational. We all have stuff. We all have painful things. I compare that to a set of parallel train tracks. And on one side are the painful things that break our hearts, but what's running right alongside that train track of pain is the train track of joy, of good things, of happiness, of beauty, of loveliness, where things go right. And those tracks run right next to each other all through our lives. And we sometimes try and outsmart the sorrow track and think if we can just positive think positive thoughts or good thoughts that won't ever have to deal with sorrow, and that's just not true. Sorrow comes to all of us. So it's not a matter of somehow by positive thinking we can experience joy. No, it's accepting both the sorrow and the joy together and choosing them then to see it from God's point of view, and that's the challenge. So we don't have to look elsewhere when life is hard or we're struggling, and we should remember not to go running after life's pleasures, which can be empty and temporary. We need faith to turn to God for true and lasting joy, because he is good. And lastly, we're right coming into land now. Here we go. Last page or two. There is actually another one there, which I have now managed to put in the wrong place. There we go. God is gracious. This is a quote from a, a book I tried to get hold of uh, this week and managed to order the wrong one, so I had to find it somewhere else. This is a quote from The uh, Sixty Second Marriage by Rob Parsons. Very good book. It was a perfect evening until the dessert came. I'm no cook, but even I could tell that the sponge cake had an endearing, frisbee-like look. And that wouldn't have mattered a scrap if he hadn't made his little joke about it. Now, I've admitted that I thought it looked like a frisbee, but what I didn't know was that she was about to, take, to test its aerodynamics it hit him square on. She burst into tears and ran out. My wife followed her upstairs, and I helped him clear the cream off the curtains. He asked me, what happened? I said, a ghost visited us. And we talked about his father-in-law, a man I knew well. I believe the man had loved his wife, but for some reason he had constantly brought her down in public. Humiliated her over her clothes, her weight, and yes, her cooking. The young woman upstairs had watched her father break every ounce of self esteem his wife might have had. I said, Your wife saw her father in you. He is still alive, but it's as if his ghost came. Our past can turn up in our lives any moment and it's very strong but we have to acknowledge it and deal with it we need to ask why am I feeling that way why am I saying these things why is this such a big deal for me particularly if you live with other people as most of us do because the way you look at things is colored by the way you came into this world and were brought up, the way they look at things can be completely different. And you can see the two situations in two very, very different ways. 
We are all products of our backgrounds and our life experiences. These can affect our reactions to specific events. We need to check our perceptions of what we think about who God is. We've been taught things about who Jesus is and how God is towards us, which are not necessarily true. We can misunderstand the grace of God and his love towards us, the church background you were brought up in, the what you were taught at Sunday school, the way you think about who God is. You can form a theology that is not necessarily correct based on the way you were brought up. Jesus walked this earth as a human being just like us. He didn't float around three feet above the floor with a halo on. He didn't look like a lot of the pre-Raphaelite paintings, beautiful though they are with his long golden hair and his red robe and his perfect white complexion. It's very unlikely he looked like that, I would just like to point out. In Palestine of his day, he, he wouldn't have looked like that. <laughs> it would have been very odd if he had. But he was human. You know, we all know the children's Bible pictures. Gentle Jesus carrying the lamb. He loved the children coming to him. But how about this one? This was nearly the only picture I showed this morning. But I'm not very good with PowerPoint, so I didn't. So you have to accept the words. This is from John 2, 13 to 16. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle and sheep and doves and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So... He made a whip out of cords, and he drove them all from the temple cords, courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He said, get out of here! Stop turning my father's house into a market. Sorry, I shouted quite so loud there. I don't think you probably got the whole story from that very short description. Um... This wasn't a sudden outburst, by the way. He didn't go in and get, like, mad on the spot. He went in, got a bit miffed, went away, and made a whip. Now, this is Jesus, okay? He made a whip, a whip with knots in it. You know, we're not talking a little bit of string here. You know, I looked at the pictures online. I tried to find the good one, you know, and a lot of them, they weren't good ones. He was there with his little string thing, you know. This was a whip. You know, he was a carpenter. He knew how to make a whip. You know, he probably made them before. They had annoying sheep. They had annoying goats. You needed a proper whip. You know, you couldn't go out there with a little bit of string. It was proper rope with big knots in it. You know, he, 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 was, not, he was not happy about what was going on. Um, he came back and he created a scene. It was chaos. I don't like scenes. I would have been behind the bins like the boy in the story earlier. You know, I would have had my head down saying, Ooh, Jesus, you know, don't do this. Um, but it wasn't like he was cross at the people so much. He was cross about or angry about what, was going on. The situation didn't reflect what he knew about God. He was angry, and it was okay to be angry. You know, people were not representing the Father in the way he needed to be represented. It says in the Bible that God is a jealous God. How many times do you think jealousy is a good emotion? You know, somebody said, oh, you're a jealous person. You wouldn't like that, would you? But he was a jealous God. He's jealous about you. You know, he wants, he wants you to love him. He doesn't want you to love other things apart from him. So, yeah, jealousy is fine as long as it's directed towards the things of God. We should be angry about some things. You know, there are situations who don't reflect who God is. Poverty should make us angry. Injustice, inequality, sickness should make us angry. God doesn't make people sick. He doesn't want them to be sick. There's no sickness in heaven. If it's not in heaven, God doesn't like it. He didn't create it. It's part of our fallen world. God is gracious to us. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. 
but he loves us just the way we are. He doesn't want us to be punished. He wants to forgive us. If we feel overwhelmed by difficult circumstances from the past and the present, which cause us to be plagued by difficult emotions, here's an ultimate giant story. A champion named Goliath was from Gath. He came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. No, I've no idea how big a cubit is. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing about 5,000 shekels. Don't know how much a shekel is either, but it's quite a lot apparently. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves. They're like metal things on the front of your leg. And a bronze javelin was strung on his back. Big pointy stick. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod. No, 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 I don't know what those are either. And its iron points weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Servants of Saul, he got that slightly wrong there. Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome you, him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. And the Philistine said, this day, I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man. Let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Now David knew who the armies really were being led by. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. So both David and the Israelites are confronted by the situation. The Israelites see the giant in relation to themselves, but David sees the giant in relation to God. A man was traveling. You've probably heard this one before. He came upon a farmer working in a field and asked him what the people in the next village were like. The farmer asked, what were the people like in the last village you visited? The man responded, they were kind. They were friendly, generous. They were great people. You'll find the people in the next village are the same, said the farmer. Another man who was traveling to the same village came up to the same farmer somewhat later and asked him what the people in the next village were like. Again, the farmer asked, what were the people like in the last village you visited? The second man responded, oh, they were rude, unfriendly, dishonest people. You'll find the people in the next village are the same, said the farmer. You're not affected so much by your environment and your circumstances, but how you actually see your environment and your circumstances. Ephesians 2, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him, in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomprehensible riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We don't have to prove ourselves. God is gracious towards us. He knows what we're like. He made us as we are, on purpose. 